in part by a grant from the Washington State Legislature and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This program is produced under the supervision and control of KCPQ Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. The legislature took a major step towards redistricting itself today when the House Constitutions, Elections, and Governmental Ethics Committee approved House Joint Resolution 31. The final form of that resolution was not very popular with Common Cause and other lobbyists who've been down here in Olympia trying to persuade the legislature to pass an anti-gerrymandering clause. That clause, in the original form of the bill, was dropped by the committee today. Gerrymandering is the common political practice of carving up legislative districts to favor a particular political party. Gerrymandering has happened in the past in this state, and some had hoped that a constitutional amendment to prohibit it would safeguard the redistricting process from partisan politics. On tomorrow night's Olympia 79, we'll have more on the redistricting legislation, and we'll also have some reaction to today's vote. Homemakers who find themselves without the support of a spouse through death, divorce, abandonment, or disability are finally being considered a viable constituency in the community in need of economic and social assistance. Legislation in the Senate and the House is being considered which would set up a pilot program to aid these displaced homemakers. Here's a report from Nancy Haley. Homemakers that have devoted their life to the operation of a home and family can find themselves in a predicament if their means of support falls through. The need to become self-sufficient, both psychologically and economically, is not only important to the displaced homemaker, but to the future of the family. Legislation establishing a pilot project under which the Council for Post-Secondary Education will establish centers and job training and placement programs for displaced homemakers is being heard in both the Senate and House. Total support of such a project was voiced Friday in the Senate Social and Health Services Committee meeting. Senator the members of the Senate Social and Health Service Committee, I bring back to you a bill that we sponsored two years ago that didn't quite make it uh, through the session and, as a matter of fact, did not get out of Ways and Means Committee. The new bill, Senate Bill 2406, is similar to the 1977 bill we have had to add some corrections as far as the implementing agency is concerned. Okay. The tone of the council's discussion, I think, was set by one council member who is a, a woman who is one of the state's leading attorneys with the following comments. She said, I think it's a very much needed component of our range of services to people. I receive calls from women constantly who are coming out of what they perceive as good marriages and stable situations and have now had their whole sense of confidence undermined. I see the range of services they're going to need some kind of a program which allows them to test their work, test their skills in an unconfronting situation and then out into a job. Uh, other council members, while expressing initially a certain amount of question about whether a planning agency primarily should get into program administration, ended up coming down very positively that we should if the sign undertakes uh, this responsibility, particularly as a pilot project, and there was consensus of the council members on that position. Displaced homemakers fall between the cracks of federal income security programs and state aid. They usually are ineligible for Social Security benefits because they are too young. Many will never qualify because they were divorced from the family wage earners short of a marriage of 20 years. They are ineligible for aid to dependent children if their children are over 18 and they are not physically disabled. They may lose their rights as beneficiaries under Social Security for the same reason. They are ineligible for unemployment compensation because they've been engaged in unpaid labor in the home. They are subject to discrimination in seeking employment because of age, sex, and, and lack of recent paid work experience. They are, are the unfortunate victims of a changing society, a society which to date has not designed and funded programs to meet their unique needs. With the obvious consensus of the assembly, Chairman Day called for a vote. Substitute Bill Glaub, do pass the ways and means. Is there any discussion? Questions? 
All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. The bill is out and on its way to raise the meeting. Nice to be popular. <laughs> Gotta be here when we kill one. <laughs> The House Social and Health Services Committee is holding hearings on their complimentary bill, House Bill 306, tomorrow afternoon. The Senate bill is now on its way to the Ways and Means Committee. Senate Bill uh, 2406 is competing for a lot of money from the general fund. Do you feel that Ways and Means is going to be receptive to your uh, request? I think that they may be more receptive this time. Uh, the chairman of Ways and Means has stated publicly that he feels that there is a need for some social programs in the state of Washington, and he was very supportive of the Senior Citizen Services Act, which was passed out of Ways and Means just on Thursday evening, mm -hmm. or Wednesday evening, I guess it was. So I believe that there is more support from him. I believe that the committee is structured differently this year. We have new faces, many of whom are on the bill as sponsors. The cutoff point for the introduction of new legislation was reached last week. No more new bills may be introduced this session. For one legislative staff, the cutoff was not an ending, but a beginning. Here's Kurt Milton with the story. Bills. Thousands and thousands of bills. Each session sees a small mountain of prospective laws introduced into both houses of the Washington State Legislature. Legislators and lobbyists make the proposals, but who does the actual job of writing the bill, checking and cross-checking the language, looking at other laws to see how they'll be affected by the new law, typing and retyping to make sure everything is letter perfect? The answer is to be found at the end of this hallway on the first floor of the legislative building. This is the office of the state code revisor, and it is here that legislative proposals are written into bill form and prepared for publication. Dennis Cooper is the state code revisor, and he oversees a hard-working staff of legal experts, bill drafters, and computer operators. Uh, the cutoff on the introduction of new bills uh, passed this last week. So this office was processing uh, 800 bills within a week's time, and this required uh, long hours and uh, the utmost from our computerized uh, processing system. To aid in the drafting process, a million-dollar high-speed computer with instant access to proposals and all current laws does the job of typing and filing the bills. Cooper says Washington is one of the leading states in using computers to draft and store bills. Uh, our lawyers use their legal uh, knowledge and their drafting skills to express the legislators' ideas as clearly as possible, taking into account the existing laws and the constitutional uh, prohibitions that uh, we may be encountering. Uh, we will draft the law from uh, an idea. The member may bring his constituent with him or the idea that his constituent has, has expressed, and we will formulate the entire measure, or we may be uh, merely editing the legislator's draft or the draft of another attorney. This year, we have uh, on my log books uh, 4,300 requests as of this date. 3,700 of those uh, have come in since November 1st. This is uh, slightly higher than the prior session, but then we didn't have a session in 1978, so there was uh, a backlog to some extent of ideas and requests. About 2,700 uh, have been introduced and will be before the legislature. And of that number, about uh, one of ten will actually pass. The work of the Code Revisor's Office is hardly over. They will continue accepting amendments and drafting substitute bills for the rest of the session. During the remaining months of the year, a slightly smaller staff will prepare the new laws and other legal documents for publication. The big rush may be over for now, but there's always next year. The fruits of the Code Revisor's labor are being discussed every day in committees throughout the Senate and the House. Here are some highlights of that committee action. 
The House Ecology Committee is considering a bill that would require annual vehicle inspections in areas not in compliance with federal clean air standards. The bill is in response to revisions made to the Federal Clean Air Act in 1977 by Congress. In order to qualify for extensions in meeting 1982 federal standards for auto emissions, states must set up vehicle inspection programs. Two proposals are being considered in the Ecology Committee, one of which would require vehicles in areas in violation of the standards to have an annual inspection to receive their license. Final committee action on the bill may come as soon as tomorrow afternoon. Over in the Senate, after a lengthy discussion on Friday, the Senate Parks and Recreation Committee held in committee Senate Bill 2569, establishing a reciprocal surcharge on overnight camping in state parks by residents of other states. In other action on Friday, the Judiciary Committee gave a due pass to Senate Bill 2174, prohibiting the unlawful possession and sale of drug-related paraphernalia. Senate Bill 2414, establishing certain procedures to inform and assist victims of crime, was passed out as a substitute bill. The committee also gave a due pass to Senate Bill 2342, adding a court reporter to the Judicial Council, and moved as amended Senate Bill 2417, which adds procedures for imposing and enforcing restitutions to the victims of crime. Senate Bill 2416, providing for return of stolen property in police custody to the owner of the property, was held in committee. This morning, the Ways and Means Committee in the Senate heard testimony on the business and occupations taxes bill before it. The bills changed tax deductions, excise tax, and communication and transportation taxes, among several other modifications. The committee also considered an omnibus business and occupation bill, which would contain many miscellaneous provisions and appropriations. On this 36th legislative day, both the House of Representatives and the Senate met in full session. The number of bills that have passed through committee and are awaiting action on the floor is growing by the day. First a report from Bruce McDonald in the Senate, and then we'll hear from Olympia 79 reporter Veronica O'Berry in the House of Representatives. The Senate spent a long, uninterrupted portion of the day clearing several more gubernatorial appointees and bills that had bipartisan support. However, this was all preparatory to an involved floor debate on a bill that increases the number of Superior Court judges throughout the state. The original bill included only five new judges, but a group of amendments from senators around the state, including more judges for their districts, upset the boat. It was realized that the amendments brought the total to around 14 new judges. Somewhat unlike Senator Brodiger, the uh the need for this additional judge in Yakima was known to me prior to coming over here, but I failed to get down to Senator Marsh's committee in time to get the amendment on in committee. Uh, and further, uh, Senator Donahue, I recognize the problem with the fiscal impact. But in the case of Yakima County, anyway, there have been about 700 additional cases a year in Yakima County, of which over 200 were created by the passage of the Juvenile Code two years ago. Uh, so we do have a responsibility of provide enough judges when we pass laws that uh, make additional work. Chelan County, with one judge, is long overdue for a second judge, but by moving the borders and putting them in with uh, Douglas County, they have full schedule for two judges. And that would leave Grant County with, uh, with just one judge, which they need an extra judge there. They have it'd be uh, 1.8 judges at the present time. Once the amendments passed, what was of paramount concern to many senators was both whether this was the best method of decreasing the workload in our court system, and could the state pay for 14 or 15 new judges in Spokane, Clark, Kitsap, Chelan, Pierce, Okanagan, Thurston, Pacific, and other counties. I'm frankly reluctant to delay the bill an additional day. It's been on the calendar a number of days. I noticed, Senator Rasmussen, that you did not object to rolling the barrel for two additional judges for Pierce County. You're getting more than anyone else in this particular bill. Uh, I think the statistics by the court administrator's office uh, justify these additional judges, and I didn't hear any arguments against these judges when they were being debated on the floor. Uh, justice delayed is justice denied, and very frankly, there's a real need out there for judges now. I'm confident uh, we've looked at these amendments carefully. I'm confident they're now in order, and I'm confident the 
judges are needed now, and I think we ought to pass the bill at this time. Senator Rasmussen. Mr. President, members of the Senate, I didn't think a motion to delay would take that long an answer. Uh, you will notice that I did not offer the amendment for two new judges in Pierce County. And uh, that's part of my concern also as to whether or not they're needed. And I know that uh, with the cost of two new judges, there is no space at the present time for all the judges that want to sit. I would hope that, number one, that the bar probably out in the hinterlands is acting the same way as we're doing with this bill. It's a major bill. I know that Senator Marsh said that the information was not received by the committee in time to act. But a major bill of this type probably should have been taken back to the committee and worked over, and where they had the chance to analyze the information. But the other thing is that bothers me, we continually increase the judges, increase the load uh, on the taxpayers at the local level. We haven't done very much to modernize the court system. And that would be of high priority. We are having uh, not uh, justice delayed, of course, is, uh, is not very good justice. And I agree with uh, uh, Senator Bonadieu that probably he and my son have had their case delayed. But I also would agree that probably that's because some judge wanted to go home early and didn't want to come back for another day or two. And there's nothing you can do about a judge that does that. And I'm not going to cite specific case under the body jerk, but I'll keep it secret what you've told me. <laughs> and and it, it doesn't provide very effective justice, of course, for the lawyers that are trying their cases there because the judges sometimes are influenced by the attitude of the attorney in the court. But it is a very pressing problem that we should be taken care of rather than just piling judges on top of judges and not getting any action out of the courts. And uh, I'm not capable of handling it. I know there's a problem there, but I depend on the bright people that are in the bar to do that. And I'm quite grateful that the new Chief Justice over there, Judge Utter, has indicated that's one of his high priorities is to see what he can do to modernize and speed up justice in this state. We should most certainly cooperate with him rather than increasing the judges and not doing much for justice. It would seem to me that if we were to pass a good mandatory sentencing act, which is something that the people are crying out for, we could really reduce their workload by locking up the dangerous repeat offenders that keep getting out time and time again. This was one of the first ballots that seemed at first to be in question as many senators voted across party lines. Some voted on philosophy, others over their districts being excluded, and still others objected to the speed the amendments passed. It was evident, eventually, that the bill would pass, but for a while it had a few guesses. Starting the week off on the House floor, amendments to a bill that provides for the planning, design, construction, furnishing and landscaping of a multi-theater international performing arts center. The idea of this amendment is to actually change the course that this legislature would take in providing grants by virtue of bonds being floated in the state to establish performing art facilities across the state of Washington. As you'll note from the bill, it's intended to be a designated bond for one given geographic area. The amendment is intended to correct that course of action and to provide the opportunity for the Arts Commission, which subsequently in a further amendment will be able to evaluate locations across the state and determine where performing arts facilities should be located not only in the best interest of the people who will use those facilities and pay for them, but on behalf of the legislature so that we in effect will know that the monies are going to be used in a way that will go to the maximum number of people. Most of Representative Eller's amendments call for the Arts Commission or some other legitimate professional group to advise the legislature as to where performing arts centers should be established and how funds should be spent. The only person speaking in opposition to any of the amendments 
as Representative Bob Everly. I think each center individually should be considered by a committee of this House, and I know they will be. Uh, Representative Warnke has pointed out that this particular proposal has been considered for two years extensively. Substantial uh, data has been compiled. Uh, this would be a good bill. Uh, it would uh, pay for operating costs out of net revenues and uh, pay for the uh, bonds we are proposing out of the sales tax paid by tourists coming into the state. Uh, I believe that the effect of voting for these amendments is in effect to kill the bill. I urge you to vote against the amendments. Vote 5937. While the Performing Arts Bill has been an extremely controversial issue, one interesting fact seems to have been overlooked. Weyerhaeuser wants to donate land for a Performing Arts Center in the vicinity of Federal Way. Weyerhaeuser also owns a considerable amount of land surrounding the proposed site for the center. If their donation is accepted, that surrounding land would be prime for development and Weyerhaeuser would stand to make a profitable gain. Opponents of the bill are questioning Weyerhaeuser's generosity and asking if it's really the interests of the people and the arts they have in mind. One of the bills that is bound to stir up a lot of debate here in Olympia is legislation to protect the Nisqually Delta, long a focus of attention as a national wildlife refuge and one of the few remaining undeveloped estuaries in the nation. The Weyerhaeuser Company would like to build on the fringes of the Delta, and that has environmentalists and some legislators worried. Here with a background report is Olympia 79 reporter Chris LeBeau. The Nisqually Delta is one of the last unspoiled estuaries along the Pacific coast. It is a vital link in the Pacific Flyway and a highly productive marine nursery. The Delta is a place of beauty and peace, but for the past several years it has been the center of an intense struggle over the key issues of growth in Washington. The controversy began with Weyerhaeuser's proposal for a log and forest product export center on a 3,200-acre site slightly north of Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. Weyerhaeuser feels that this would centralize their activities and provide jobs and taxes for the region. After an extensive environmental study, their plan was accepted by the city of DuPont late last month. But opposition is growing. The Nisqually Delta Association is currently suing Weyerhaeuser and DuPont for failure to adopt a comprehensive municipal plan. And their position is supported by a number of labor organizations, education councils, sportsmen groups, as well as government agencies. They believe the proposal is close enough to the Delta to have a significant impact. They state first that the proposal violates the intent of the Shoreline Management Act, which protects areas of statewide significance. Second, that it will destroy terrestrial habitat and affect wildlife by the increased amount of rail, truck, and ship traffic. Third, that chronic low-level oil and ballast pollution will destroy the AA water quality of the reach. Fourth, that there is no assurance that Weyerhaeuser will not further develop the site, possibly including construction of a pulp mill. And finally, that the practice of exporting logs adversely affects regional mills and employment. The association has now taken their case to the legislature. Bills introduced in both houses would prohibit the development of major port facilities in the Delta area, including the Weyerhaeuser proposal. Representative Joanne Brecky is the sponsor in the House, Senator Mark Gaspard in the Senate. Representative Brecky, why has the legislature now become involved with the question of the Delta and the proposed Weyerhaeuser development? I feel that both the state and the nation have uh, legislation involving the protection of the Delta area, and I feel it is something that we need to follow up the original legislation to ensure that protection. Okay. How do you balance this question of development and yet preservation of resources? Well, this particular area is an area of statewide significance, a shoreline of statewide significance, as we determined in 1971 with the Shorelines Management Act. And I think that it is an area that needs to be protected. Most of our delta areas have been turned into port facilities throughout the state, and this is one that is left. Supporters of the Weyerhaeuser proposal feel that this is, in effect, going to uh, block, where, block Weyerhaeuser's project, block the economic, necessary economic development of the area. Is this what you intend by this bill? I disagree with the term uh, necessary economic development, but yes, I do not want to see any increase over the past historical use, and this would be very much more so. 
What chance do you feel this bill has in committee? It's been a hard road getting it assigned. Well, now that we have an assignment, I'm delighted. We are going to have a public hearing on Tuesday, the 20th, which is a week from tomorrow. I'm delighted that we're at last getting a hearing. It is going to be before the Ecology Committee. I have every hope. It's an uphill battle, and we have a very short session, but I have every hope that we will get full consideration. Are you satisfied with Weyerhaeuser's claims that this will be the only extent of their development, this, this one export facility? Not at all. I believe that their previous information uh, up until the last year or two did indicate a very different kind of thing. I also have to wonder why uh, there is ownership of 3,200 acres with a 250-acre development. I think the legislature has a commitment to oversee or overview major developments that go on in the state of Washington, especially when they have or could have an um, environmentally uh, impact uh, on a certain area of citizens that go beyond just the city of DuPont. Uh, the people, the residents of Anderson Island um, have had very little say on how this major development is going to affect them. And they have come to me and they've asked me to, can't you do something in the legislature to help us? Uh, so I have introduced a bill to do that. Well, I think that we're reaching a stage in our development of this nation that we have to question the quality of life rather than the quantity of life. We no longer have the great frontier. We don't longer have the push further west. We're to the ocean shores now. And it's going to change a lot of philosophy, I think, that, that uh, we as Americans have and Washingtonians have about the use of our land. Uh, we, we've got to use it more wisely than we're doing right now. And I just have to believe that when you're going to develop the last major river estuary in the whole west coast, that we have to ask a lot more questions about that development than we are doing now, and we have to have more commitments on long-range development. Uh, the frontiers are gone, and now I think it's up to us to preserve some of those natural areas that we have as we grew up for our future generations to have and see it and to see them unspoiled by, by uh, economic development and industrial development. At the heart of the Nisqually Warehouser issue is the question of land use. Can we have two very different land uses, one industrial, one conservancy, exist side by side and still protect the resources we want to protect? There's also the question of trade-off. How much can we trade off for economic development and still conserve our basic natural resources? Thus far, this question has been in the arena of special groups and the courts, but it's now placed before the legislators and therefore before the people of the state of Washington. The question is now placed, how you want to see the land of Washington used in the future. Tomorrow evening on Olympia 79, we'll have some excerpts for you from the governor's weekly press conference, plus our usual mix of committee hearings, floor action, and other events here in the state capitol. And don't forget the legislative hotline to contact your representative, dial 1-800-562-6000. It's your government, and the legislature has provided this way for you to keep in touch. For Olympia 79 in the state capitol, I'm Jeff Hanley. Tune in tomorrow night. We'll all be back. Have a pleasant evening. Good night. <laughs> This program is funded in part by a grant from the Washington State Legislature and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This program is produced under the supervision and control of KCPQ Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content.